I assume some of you are heading for the crash out that way as well. And for the adults, let's pray together. Let's pray that God would uh, help us to understand his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, your grace to us. We thank you for this book of Ezra that we've been studying. Father, please would you help us. Please we cry out for the work of your spirit in our lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're thinking about this idea of repent, this idea of repentance. We need to repent. Now, it's not really a very sort of common English word. I can't think of where you might use it. But if we're going to be a Christian, then repentance is a really important word that we need to understand. Um, Have I got my pointer? I have, see if it works. It's going to work? Why is it not going to work? You may need to click it on for me, Philip. So this is what repentance means. Keep going. It's about a change of mind. It starts in our minds, about a change of mind, and that leads into a change of direction. So we're going one way, we're going our way, and we need to come back and to think about going God's way. And that's really the heart of Jesus' challenge to the world. The first words he says in Mark's gospel are repent and believe the good news. Turn back to God and believe the good news. And so if we're going to be a Christian, then we need to understand repentance. We need to understand what it means and what it it means in our minds about how turning back to God. And maybe you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you're here and you're just investigating the Christian faith, then it's important that we understand what repentance is, that we need to turn back to God. And Ezra chapter 10, our final study in the book of Ezra, is an important study in this issue of repentance. Now, it's not an easy passage. I think as it was being read, it threw up all sorts of questions for you, and we'll look at some of those questions. but the big picture is clear, and we see that in Ezra 9 and 10. We go, we're, we're very prone to go our way, away from God, and we need to repent and come back to God. So I say this is our final study in the book of Ezra, and I hope you found it really encouraging in our, in our adult Sunday school, in our Christian discipleship uh, program that started at 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, we thought about, we did a sort of overview highlights of Ezra, and we thought about the fact that We've seen God powerfully overruling great leaders and emperors. We've seen about God bringing about his great plans. You just see that God's plans often focus on a very small number of people. So the number of exiles who come back at the beginning is about 40,000. Gerard proudly said that there would be more people at a West Ham home game than people who came back um, from the exile. But I hope that's a great encouragement to us. We may feel, as Christians, there aren't many of us here, might feel slightly beleaguered, but the great thing is that God works out his plan, often even through small numbers of people. God had gloriously brought the people back so they could worship him and rebuild his temple. And we saw again and again how God graciously provided for them, graciously um, gave them. There's that lovely verse in chapter 3 that talked about his love enduring forever for his people. God is working out his purposes. But last week we came to chapter 9, and sometimes chapter 9 is a bit of a dampener. We're on page 481 because we began to realize that God's people had begun to turn away from him. So in chapter 9 and verse 1, The leaders came to Ezra and say, the people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. The people around the world had just, so the people, God's people in Israel had just begun to drift into the lifestyles of the people around them and not to follow God. And we thought ourselves how easy it is for us to slip gently back into the ways of the world rather than the ways of God. 
And we saw how upset Ezra was by it. We thought that by the fact that he was appalled by it, we t- were told in verse 3. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. And he begins in chapter 9 to make this, you know, it's amazing. He tore his cloak, he pulled out his hair, and he began to pray. Next slide. He began to pray in chapter, chapter 9 about their unfaithfulness. We thought about that. And how he said their sins are higher than their heads and were reaching into the heavens. Well, let's pick it up in chapter 10. And my title is this point, uh, Repentance Then. Next slide, I think, Repentance Then, chapter 10. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large, large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him. And the challenge we thought of, is, are we up, as upset by sin in our lives, the lives of those around us, as Ezra was, or are we just sometimes a bit complacent? Oh, it doesn't matter, I've done it before, God won't mind. Ezra is not, Ezra can see how offensive God's, uh, how offensive our sin is to God. I don't need to pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, would convict us and help us to see our sin. And then we come to what I think is the decisive verse in the passage. Verse 2, right at the bottom of page 481. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the Apostle Rams. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. So among the crowd of men, women, and children, a lovely description of God's people coming together. They want to engage with God. Men, women, and children coming together. This man, Shechaniah, gets up and he says two things. Um, so talk, we're going to do a bit of work uh, with your neighbor. Um, what are the two things that our, um, Shechaniah says? You talk to your neighbor. What are the two things that Shechaniah basically says in verse 2? What are the two things that Shechaniah says? Anyone going to be brave enough to give me an answer? The first thing is they have been unfaithful to God. Yeah, it says we have been unfaithful to our God. Absolutely. Um, So notice, you know, he he doesn't make any excuses. Uh, There's no sort of blame shifting. He doesn't pretend it's not serious. He says, no, we have been unfaithful to God. We have sinned. Great, yep. And uh, what is the second thing that he says at the end of the sentence? There is still hope. Fantastic. I think it's almost the most important sentence in this uh, passage. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. We have done wrong. We have sinned. But in spite of that, there is hope. And my first kid's question is, is there still hope for people who rebel against God? Is there still hope for people who rebel against God? So despite their sin... Despite their terrible behavior, there is still hope. What a wonderful thing that is. What a wonderful part of the, well, it's the heart of the Christian message, really. That whatever we've done, there is still hope. Maybe we look back on some sin that we've done in the past, and somehow we can't quite 
get it out of our minds and we think, can God really forgive me? Is there still hope for me or is it all over? Maybe it's not just one sin, but maybe you know, a catalogue of sins we can think of. We think, can God really forgive me? Is there really hope for me or is it just gone? Or maybe we've just, we realize we've sent a season of backsliding from the Lord, of just turning away from him and going our own way. But still there is hope. But still there is hope. And I hope if, if, you know, if we go with nothing else this morning, that hope that we can turn back from our sin, receive God's forgiveness, still there is hope. Now, how do we receive this hope? How does it come about? And the answer to that comes in verse 3. Now, let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Now, the details, and we'll look at the details, and then that verse may throw up all sorts of questions, but we'll have a look at the moment. And I'm not sure I've got answers to all the questions. But at the heart of it, he is saying we need to turn back to God. We need to repent. How do we access this hope? Not by wallowing in our sin, not by saying, oh, I'm just going to keep going, but saying, no, we need to turn back to God. We need to repent. So how do we access this hope? We need to repent. A change of mind leading to a change of action. And my second children's question is, what did the people have to do to receive God's forgiveness? What did the people have to do to receive God's forgiveness? So last week we saw Ezra's great confession, his great acknowledgement of their sin and their wrongdoing. This week we see that sadness, that confession must lead to action. And then we get the description of what the repentance looks like, what it meant for them. Verse 3 again. Let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Well, I, I think we all sort of slightly rear back off that verse. Is that right? Is it right they're going to send away the women and the children who, who uh, encourage them to worship other gods? Are we, does that have any sort of, are we meant to be doing that today in our relationships you know, with people who don't believe? And the very simple answer is no, we, we, the New Testament and the Old Testament are different at this point, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. There's definitely no call in the New Testament for believers to divorce unbelieving husbands or wives. So why is there this action now? I'm not sure I've got all the answers. But at a very basic level, it was absolutely critical to the salvation of the whole world that the Jewish nation continued to exist. Because if you didn't have a Jewish nation with the laws and the, uh, the customs, um, you wouldn't have a Messiah. You need a Messiah. We need the Jewish nation needs to have sufficient integrity uh, sufficient understanding of the law so that a Messiah could be born into that nation uh, to bring salvation. And as the intermarrying and the cultural merging went on, the Jewish culture, the Jewish language, and the law well, could just get lost. Cultures do get lost through intermarrying. It's absolutely critical for the salvation of the world that there, is a, that there was a Jewish nation who knew the law you, you know, who spoke the language, who understood the culture of that, who understood about Abraham, who understood about David, so that the Messiah could be born into that. Now, of course, in the New Testament, things are very different. Jesus has been born into the newish nation. He was born a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David. He knew the law. He understood the law. He obeyed the law. He died according to the law so that we could be forgiven. And since the glorious day of Pentecost, you may remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the day of Pentecost, where God enabled them to speak all the different languages, those first Christians to speak the different languages. There's a sense in which Christianity has not been tied to any language, it's not been tied to any, Christ, any uh, physical places <clears throat> or any cultures. It truly is a worldwide movement. So I think that's why the application then is different for us. Now, you still might be saying, well, hang on, that still sounds harsh. What happened to those wives and children? Who was going to look after them and care for them? 
I think there are two important things. I'd say I'm not sure I've got all the answers, but I think there are two important things to note. The first one is this was going to be done according to the law. Look with me at the end of verse 3. Let it be done according to the law. And what is clear about the law is that it had a great, well, God, the God behind the law had a great compassion and love and care for the widows and the orphans, the fatherless and the foreigner. Uh, next slide, please, Philippe, I think. I hope I've got a couple of verses from the law. Here we are. So Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18. God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners. So here's a picture. God loves the widow and the orphan, the fatherless, the foreigner, and wants the uh, Israelites to do that as well. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes, let's bring all your gifts of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the foreigners, the fathers and widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied. And so Lord your God may bless you in all the works you have. So if this was going to be done according to the law, then it was going to be done with great compassion and great provision for those people. And then the other thing to note, um, uh, sorry, that's a kid's question. Did God's law tell the people to look after widows and the fathers? Did God's law tell people to look after the widows and the fatherless. Uh, and the next point I want to make, just I think it helps us understand better, is in verses 16 and 17, I'm going to get you to do some work, how long did this process take? Verses 16 and 17, how long did this process take? Is there a bit of maths involved in that? How long did the process take? Yeah, we're assuming 12 months, yes. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. How, many, how long did it take? Three, two, three. I, think, two, I think it's three, I think, isn't it? So the beginning of the 10th month would be the beginning of October. We're doing another thing. So you've got October, November, December, because they start, they finished on the first day of the first month. So three, I think. Three, okay. Now, from the, from, the num, from the list of names, we estimate there are about 120 cases. Some of I haven't done the maths. Various other people I read who've read through the maths. So we're saying 90 days, 120 cases. I mean, it was a slow process. And I think the reason it was a slow process, they, you know, they want to make sure the provision was in place uh, for these people. That's, that, that's the way. So, um, okay, so that's the old test. That, that's, that's, I'm not sure it answers all the questions, but that's... I hope that helps us a little bit to understand a bit about what is going on here. But maybe probably more pressing, well, what happens in the New Testament? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not called upon to, uh, if I'm married to an unbeliever, I'm not called upon to divorce them. So what, what, what is the New Testament principles? I think there are three principles that the New Testament would say in this issue. That if we are believers, firstly, if we are believers, then it's clear that we shouldn't marry a non-Christian. The Bible talks about not being yoked with unbelievers. And the reason is the same reason here. There's every chance that that person will actually pull us away from following the Lord Jesus Christ. And I told a, a, I found an alarming story of some students who met together, um, some Christian students, uh, well, students about 10 years ago. Sadly, seven of them had married uh, unbelieving um, spouses, and all of them had now stopped going to church. I thought very, very uh, disturbing. But that's the warning. So if we're Christians... We're called not to marry non-Christians. But, but for all sorts of reasons, if you're a Christian, you may well end up uh, being married to a non-Christian. That may happen for all sorts of reasons. Two people who are Christians may uh, start the Christian life, get married, and then one of them may fall away. One of them may turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ, leave the other one, just sitting there going, well, well what do I do now? Or, or, you may, or two people may neither be Christians when they get married, and one of them may then become a Christian. Well, what are they going to do in that situation? And I think I say that, I think there are two principles uh, from there. The next slide, please. The first one comes in 1 Corinthians 7. So I think if we're a Christian and we're married to a non-Christian, we need to make every effort um, 
help if I can spell, make every effort to stay with our non-Christian husband or wife. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 12, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. But if their unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in these circumstances. So the Christian must not divorce their unbelieving spouse. Now, if the unbelieving spouse decides to divorce, then the Christian is not sinning. But the Christian is to make every effort to stay with their non-Christian spouse. And then the next slide. Sorry, the, sorry, the text is very small. The other is to seek to win your husband and wife over to the gospel. This is 1 Peter 3. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of their lives. So the husband and the wife, the Christian husband and wife, is there to try and seek to win over the non-Christian husband or wife. Um, and it's notice it's not sort of with long sermons over breakfast, but it is with seeking to live a godly life uh, before them. Um, Final kids question. How are wives meant to win their husbands to following Jesus? Now, I know that there is a lot tied up in that material, and it may throw lots of questions at you, and you may be in situations, and I'm sorry if I haven't put that as sensitively as I could. If I knew your situation, I may have put that differently. So I'm sorry if that. If you'd like to come and talk and pray either with me or one of the other elders or a member of the women's ministry team, by all means, uh, do come and talk to us about that. But as we close, I want to return to this basic principle I think this passage throws up, which is this issue of repentance. And so my second point on the sheet now is repentance now. Repentance now. It was clearly a very, very radical step to repent in that way. And just as people are called to re repent radically now, so we, as we see our sin, we're called to confess it <clears throat> and to repent. And I say that change might be a radical difference. And notice it say it took them three months to do all the consultation. As we think about what repentance may look like for us, it may that we need to speak to other Christians. Say, so if you want to come and talk to me and pray with me, I'm very happy to do that. So it may be begin in our mind. We think about repentance. The first question is, is Jesus really the Lord of my life? Do I look to Jesus the only one who can save me? He is the one I should be living for 24-7. He is the one who should be ruling over me. Is that how I think about Jesus? Or if I'm honest, is Jesus just somebody, well, he comes into my mind sometimes on Sundays, maybe when I'm in trouble, I might pray to him. But essentially, I'm just living my life my own way without the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Do I radically need to change the way that I think about Jesus? And then there are going to be my actions. So are there various areas of my life where Jesus is not really Lord? Are there areas in my life where I basically ignore Jesus? I think a world more and more is encouraging us to love ourselves and to put love of self first, whereas Jesus calls us to love our neighbor, to love God. And then all sorts of, I mean, I, yeah, are there particular ways that I use money? Are there things I watch on TV or on the internet? Are there particular ways I behave in my family or at work or at school? Is there anger that comes out? Are there lusts and desires that I follow that are wrong? Is there somebody I fundamentally need to forgive? Is my life orientated towards myself and self-indulgence or serving others? If we're honest, we know is God putting, in, you know, putting a finger on an area of my life that in your heart of hearts you know is wrong. Maybe it's a group of people you hang out with that actually a bad influence on you. Maybe you need to distance yourself from that. Can we have the next slide, please, Philip? 
Jesus uses very stark language. We think the language is stark in Ezra. Listen to these words from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, Jesus isn't saying literally cut off your limbs or gorge out your eyes, because actually it's not really your limbs or your eyes that are the problem. It's what's going on in your brain. You have to take your brain out. But he's clear that he wants us to take sin very, very seriously. And he wants us to be radical in our actions to it. And so I just want to encourage you, I want to encourage myself. Am I, you know, am I thinking radically about my sin? Are there areas that I just think, yes, I have to change that. I have to turn away from that to receive God's forgiveness and to go his way. So I say, if you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody, please do come and chat to me afterwards. But the wonderful thing is we thought at the beginning, there is still hope for Israel. There is still hope for God's people. Whatever we have done, whatever we are doing, there is still hope. As we turn away from those things, as we come and take hold of God's forgiveness and his grace and his mercy, and we seek to go his way, there is still hope. And how to access that hope? We need to radically change direction. I just want to say today would be a great day to start. I say that for them it took three months. It may take a while for you to work through all the implications and the manifestations of that. But let's pray that God would help us to see there are areas of our life that we need to repent of. Well, I put that down as a discussion question. We can talk about over coffee, maybe just take away and think about this afternoon. What areas are there that I need to turn away from, to come back to God, to receive his forgiveness again? Well, let's pray that God would indeed help us to understand these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come with Ezra and we acknowledge our appalling sin, which is higher than our heads. We're so often unfaithful to you and follow the detestable practices of the people around us who don't follow you. Father, we praise you that Shechaniah knew there was still hope. And we too can know that there is still hope, that because of your mercy and your grace and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is still hope. And we know that hope is in repentance, in that turning back to you, receiving your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness and going your way. So Father, we pray that by your help, by the power of your spirit, you would help us to change our minds and change our actions. Father, we pray that you would help us as we seek to do that, that by your spirit you would convict us of the things that we are doing, the things that we need to change. Father, please would you help us. We pray that you would help us to help each other. We think of these people uh, counseling and helping each other for three months. And Father, we pray this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our final hymn is...